Hey everybody, this is Ben Bowman and Alex Titus. Welcome back to the Oregon Bridge. The reason that Senator Betsy Johnson is so widely respected in this district is because she's insanely good at constituent casework. There's no guesswork. She's not messing with people in any way, and she's very accessible. And so by demonstrating that I had the capability and the experience to do that work and that I cared about reaching that standard. And at one point, somebody asked me how I would emulate her. And I think what I said was that's like comparing like a college ball player with Michael Jordan. All right, folks. Uh, well, today we are very excited because we have an exclusive interview with the newest member of the Oregon State Legislature, uh, Senator Designate Rachel Armitage. Uh, she was recently appointed to the State Senate by uh, county commissioners from a bunch of different uh, counties in Northwest Oregon to finish the term of Senator Betsy Johnson, um, who of course resigned from her seat to run for office, to run for governor rather as a non-affiliated independent candidate. Um, so Rachel, Alex and I have actually known each other since college. We've been friends for a long time. Um, so this was a fun, fun episode. Uh, a little bit about Rachel. Uh, she's got a deep background in politics. She's been working in and around politics for many years. Um, she grew up in Medford, uh, lived in Eugene, went to the U of O. She's currently pursuing her master's degree, uh, works at Reed College, so familiar with the higher education landscape, uh, and lives in the, com <clears throat> the community of Warren in Columbia County uh, with her husband, Reed, their stepdaughter, and their dog. Um, and now she is a member of the Oregon uh, State Senate, or will be very soon. Um, so candidates she's worked for that I think are notable. She in the, in the legislature, she worked for former representative Carla Peluso and current state representative Susan McLean. Uh, and she also worked at the national level for U.S. Senator John Tester and former Senator uh, now um, deceased, the late uh, Senator Kay Hagan from North Carolina. Um, so she understands the the politics of rural Oregon. Uh, she understands the politics of the timber industry, which we talk about. Um, and she's also got a great personality that makes it pretty funny and fun to have the conversation. So we walk through how did this all happen, the mechanics of the appointment process. But this appointment process for to fill the remainder of Senator Johnson's term was actually unusual for several reasons, um, which you'll hear us discuss in the episode. Uh, we also talk policy. We talk about, you know, what do we do for timber dependent communities that have been ravaged by automation and um, regulation that have prevented the timber industry from being what it what it used to be. Um, we talk about her age. She's going to be the youngest member of the Oregon State Senate when she uh, takes office. Uh, how do you prepare for, you know, she's got basically two weeks until her first legislative session. So she talks us through some of her thinking um, uh, about how to be prepared and, and be in a position where she can be successful. Uh, and we talk about a lot of other stuff too. So we really hope you enjoy this episode. We really appreciate you listening and uh, enjoy the interview with Senator Rachel Armitage. All right, everybody. Uh, so there's this there's this scene in the office um, where Phyllis and Bob Vance are getting married, and uh, the pastor asks um, <laughs> asks uh, Phyllis, "Do you take Bob to be your husband?" And before he asks Bob, Michael Scott goes, "I now present to you for the first time ever, Mr. and Mrs. Bob Vance." And I was thinking about that scene because th we are presenting for the first time ever, Senator Rachel Armitage. Although yeah. I believe it's Senator Designate Armitage until you're officially sworn in. Yeah. And I don't even know how that word is pronounced. Is it designate or designate? I've never, I just have never heard it. And now it's, it's, it's my title. So it's a lot, it's a lot easier on paper than out loud. Um, That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you for, for coming on the Oregon bridge. We're excited to have you. Uh, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm, uh, you know, just fresh off of the campaign trail, so to speak, we have just tons of laundry to do. What they don't <laughs> your, your personal life just falls apart when you go through a 20-day a whirlwind appointment process. But uh, doing great. We've got um, my my dogs over here taking a nap on the couch. I've just got a hot cup of coffee. It's uh, I live in gorgeous Warren, Oregon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's perfect. That's actually a good... Well, 
on that note, I hope my dog starts to take a nap, but he is staring at the door, probably about ready to bark. So my apologies to our listeners if uh, we have a disruption. But um, I'm glad you mentioned living in Warren, um, because when I was thinking about what we wanted to talk to you about, I was thinking how you've actually lived in a ton of different parts of the state. You lived in Medford, you lived in Eugene, you lived in Washington County, you live in Columbia County, uh, you, you work in Portland. Um, so I guess starting with Medford, because that's where you grew up, right? Mm-hmm. What, what are the differences growing up in Medford from the places you've lived after that? And particularly, I'm thinking like Eugene and Portland, like what's different? What was, why was the experience different in Medford than it might be for someone who grows up, who's growing up in like a Portland suburb? You know, that's a great question. I think Medford is just a little bit more insular. It's isolated geographically. Um, Once you get past Roseburg, if you're going up I-5, you're still two hours away from the next, you know, Eugene, Salem, Portland. So folks who live in those areas, I feel like are more used to driving between cities. So they get this bigger perspective. Whereas if you're from Medford, you know, you can go to Medford or Eugene or maybe Grants Pass, but you're not going to these bigger metro areas very often. And so people really, I think, tend to think in a much more isolated way, even though it's a pretty large, more um, suburban area. The other thing I would say that's pretty cool uh, about Southern Oregon is that um, there's a lot of, there's a huge art scene. It's, Mm. it's, Almost, I would say, on par with Portland, you have the Oregon Shakespeare Festival and the cabaret and um, all of these different little community theaters. And so people really do a lot of that. They participate in a lot of that. It's a big part of the culture. Um, uh, I think those are the two big things about Southern Oregon that are just uh, particularly notable. Also, so, the best donut shop in the state is from is in is in Medford. I will say that that's Donut Land. Donut Land in Tualatin so, would beg to differ with you. Yeah, but. no, it's Donut <laughs> Donut Country, Southern Oregon, Med, Medford. Real quick before I give it to Titus, um, I think there's a perception from casual observers that like, oh, Medford is like 100% Republican, Trump town. But it's not actually that simple. Like, it's certainly more conservative and predominantly Republican. But, like, there have been some relatively close legislative races in that part of the state um, over the last decade or two. So how would you describe the political composition? Yeah, I would say you will meet a lot of folks who are on the more liberal side of the spectrum Um, In one particular part of Medford, I would say in East Medford, and then that also sort of connects the way the way the geography and the major thoroughfares are those areas all connect you have East Medford then talent Phoenix and then Ashland and Ashland is a university town it's where the Oregon Shakespeare Festival is it's a super, super liberal place um, on par with Eugene I would say. Uh, And then the conservatism in Medford, I I really think, and I've always thought there are different colors of conservatism. And and you really see that growing up in Southern Oregon. So you have people who are, um, who come by their conservatism religiously. There are, there's a high population of Mormons and evangelical Christians who live in Southern Oregon. Um, You have folks who are Uh, you have quite an older population. So you have folks who are Republicans just because they've been Republicans and they've been conservative their whole life. Um, And then you also have people who come by their conservative conservatism from uh, a business perspective. And so they sort of see that uh, separation between government and business as being really, really important. Um, And they want to see, you know, low regulation and those types of policies. And then you also have blue collar folks who are uh, come by their conservatism um, that way, regular working class folks. Um, But those folks, I think I think that's the smallest group, to be honest, that's a high number of folks who lean more conservative in Columbia County and on this side of the state. Um, But really, I think you see a lot more like business oriented or evangelically oriented conservatives in Southern Oregon, if that makes sense. That totally makes sense. Alex? Yeah, that's super interesting. It's something we'll uh, talk, talk a little bit about the, the rural in just a second. But 
But so before we get to the appointment process, which of course we are excited to get to, uh, we know that you previously worked in the legislature and that uh, you know you had some experience there. Uh, so who did you work for, and uh, kind of like what what was the skill set, or and it could be like hard skills and soft skills, of course. Uh, that you found most valuable from your role there to prep you for your new role, which of course, uh, before you were staff and now you're a principal. So I'm really curious to hear about that. That's wild. First of all, it's uh, one of the things that happened almost immediately after getting appointed by the county commission was just receiving a ton of calls from different state senators. Like, hi, it's your new colleague. Hi, it's your new peer. Senator so-and-so, um, and my phone, my phone was completely blowing up on Friday. And these are all people that I walked the halls with. I, I knew these people as staff. And so to be in, reintroduced to them as a colleague is just a, a little otherworldly. It's, it's kind of bizarre, to be honest. Um, so I worked with Representative Susan McLean in the 2016 short session. She represents a lot of Hillsborough and then um, Cornelius and Forest Grove and some of the rural areas uh, in Washington County. And then I also worked for uh, Representative Carla Peluso in Gresham in the 2017 long session. They had entirely different issue areas. I would say they both had education in common, but uh, Representative McLean was a little more K through 12 and uh, Representative Peluso was a little more higher ed. I would say the things that I did back then that will be extremely helpful are things like understanding the process in Salem, understanding when we're introducing bills, what that looks like, understanding how to make amendments, how to um, work with different interest groups. All of those technical, technical skills I think will be really helpful to me. And frankly, those are the things that stood out with county commissioners and PCPs. I think having that experience and being able to step in and hit the ground running in that way is something that was a particularly notable trait about my candidacy. And I think that's um, probably why I'm in this position is because I've had that experience. So that, that takes us to the appointment process. For our, our uh, listeners who weren't tracking this as closely as um, I was, and certainly you were in the middle of it. Okay, so we've got Senator Betsy Johnson, one yep. of the longest ter- serving senators um, in, in the state Senate. She decides she's running for governor as an independent, um, but she doesn't immediately resign from the seat. So we don't actually know that that resignation is going to happen, but we know she's not running for reelection. So Melissa Bush steps up to run for that state Senate seat. Then Betsy Johnson says she's resigning from the seat so she can focus on running for governor. You have already, I believe, endorsed Melissa Bush at this point. You're supporting her. You want her to be the next Democratic nominee. Then this vacancy opens. And because of the way that the process works in Oregon, you actually can't, Democrats can't just say, okay, Melissa Bush is going to go to the Senate. They have to put forward three names as PCPs. And then the county commissioners from the legislative district get to pick from the three or four or five, but usually it's three names that go forward. Eventually, two former legislators, Debbie Boone and Tim Josie, put their name forward. They don't make it through. Like, you're eventually one of the final three. But before we get to that, like given the weird political dynamics of like you've endorsed this person but now you have to come up with three names what was the decision making process like for you when you were like wow am i going to put my name forward i guess i'm going to try to be a state senator but i want melissa to win like what was the dynamic how did it work yeah it happened so fast um I was sitting at work doing, I don't know, data entry or something like that when I got a phone phone call or a text message from Melissa and, you know, read the article about Senator Johnson stepping down. And initially my gut instinct was to contact various party officials and people like that to get more resources for Melissa. And then as the day progressed, people started reaching out to me and mentioning that my name also came up. And so that sort of planted a seed. But I, at first I was sort of like, yeah, no, thanks. I, uh, I'm going to support Melissa. You know, she's my friend. She's my merge sister. We're, we're neighbors. We live uh, really close to each other. Um, fun fact, Melissa, Betsy Johnson, and I live off the same exit off highway 30. <laughs> That's same a fun- that's a fun book club to imagine. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, 
so, you know, people started talking to me and then I, I started thinking about it. Uh, and, and then I found out about that statement that, um, she was requesting very specifically a placeholder candidate and knowing, um, her relationship with the county commissioners. Not everybody can request that sort of thing and get it, but because of her reputation and because of her um, close friendships, I would say, with local electeds, we knew, we figured she'd probably um, have that request granted. So that sort of opened up a lane. And from there, it it really took 24 hours of considering it to saying, I'm all in. And I had to check, you know, I had to take care of some logistics. Like I had to check with work and make sure that it was something that I could do. Um, but once, once that was in the works, it was, it was no question. And do you regret it yet? Or do you think the regret will come later where in the process? I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, well, I do. I, I think I was surprised. I, I thought that there would be a point where it would get a little bit more stressful and difficult and where I'd be a little bit more anxious. But to be honest, you know, I'm such a nerd that I had so much fun talking with our PCPs and then talking with our county commissioners. Um, I've, I've been working in the nonprofit space for a while. And so being able to dive back in, it just felt like coming home and it never, it just never got hard. So you know, I know in the words of uh, Lynn Manuel Miranda, winning is easy and governing is harder. So I, I'm, uh, <laughs> you know, it's it, it things things will likely heat up, but uh, you know, I I have really been enjoying enjoying the ride so far. So mechanically speaking, we'll go to this, and then um, Titus will ask about like the actual conversations. But so the first step is you announce you're running. And in this race, there are actually a ton of people who said they were running, like an unusually like in the Hillsborough appointment, which happened at the same time where state rep Janine Solman got appointed senator on the same day you got appointed senator. There was the PCPs only had three choices, so they had to send all three forward in years, I think, what, six, seven, eight, something like that. Yeah, eight, maybe. Yeah, eight, so you had eight people. And Basically, there was probably 100 or so PCPs in the Senate district. Um, so you're like calling these people or emailing these people and like trying to basically say like, hey, you should put my name forward as one of the three, but you should also support Melissa. Mm -hmm. um, so is that so th is that that's part one, basically? Yeah. And to be honest, I I think that without naming names yes there were several candidates I, I think pcps generally across the district once we started having these phone calls phone conversations it it became pretty obvious early on who they did not want to vote for sure um and so because melissa was already in the race and she'd already started developing relationships there were a lot of people already who were pretty interested in her candidacy and so it was really just a matter of explaining what the benefits of voting for me would also be. If I could go to the county commission with Melissa, then I could I could support her in that way. Um, so the other part of it is that we had to choose whether to send three, four, or five people to the county commissioners. And so that was also a conversation that we didn't necessarily even need to have. I think most PCPs were pretty thoughtful and had an idea of what they wanted to do already. And in fact, when it came down to it, somebody introduced the motion to appoint three people as opposed to four or five. There was one argument in favor, no arguments against, and we passed it with a voice vote, which in a process like this is almost unheard of. That just so doesn't happen. The political dynamics at play here are really, really fascinating, particularly in your district. So mm -hmm. you have PCPs, which for listeners who aren't super familiar, PCPs are like basically party activists. They're the people who go to central committee meetings for the party on both sides, uh, both Republicans and Democrats. So they actually tend to be I would argue further left right. than your average voter um, or further right on the Republican side. But the weird part in this district is it's a Democratic seat, but there was way more conservative county commissioners 
than progressive or democratic county commissioners. In fact, there's some democratic county commissioners who probably vote more similarly to a Republican than a Democrat. So you basically have to appeal to a left of center group first. And then in the second stage, you have to appeal to a right of center group. Um, so what was the, what were your, how did the conversations go with county commissioners? Like what was, what was that like? Well, I think with PCPs, I think they had a pretty good understanding of the political dynamics at play to begin with. It's, you know, I think it has been such a fun group of Democrats to work with. And I've worked with Democrats all across this state and in other states. And to a certain extent, it's like going to church. They're all sort of the same, uh, no matter where you go. <laughs> but yeah. this is a particularly fun group. Um and, and I would think, I would say the difference with county commissioners really was less about issues, although um, there was certainly a more moderate stance, of course, on things like natural resources, which makes a lot of sense um, because that na our natural resources bring in revenue that county commissioners rely on to do their jobs. But I think the difference is that county commissioners really cared more about the how of this person doing their job and PCPs cared more about the issues. So uh, it didn't take very long to realize that the reason that Senator Betsy Johnson is so widely respected in this district is because she's in insanely good at constituent casework. She calls people back. She's honest and straightforward and blunt um, about where she is. There's no guesswork. She's not messing with people in any way. And she's she's very accessible. I heard a story about Senator Johnson where somebody called her uh, and I can relate to this story because this happened to me three weeks before their wedding, they had lost their venue because of COVID and the Senator helped them find another venue. <laughs> That's the level of wow. constituent service we're talking about in, in this particular district. And so by demonstrating that I had the capability and the experience to do that work and that I cared about reaching that standard, it, you know, I think that that really stood out and I was honest. I, um, at one point, I somebody asked me um, what I thought about Senator Johnson and I uh, and how I would emulate her. And I think my what I said was that's like comparing like a college ball player, right, with Michael Jordan. Uh, <laughs> it's not, we're not we're not filling those shoes, and certainly not in a year. Um, but I think the fact that I could demonstrate an awareness of the, the benefits that she brought to the district was also something that resonated with the county commissioners. It wasn't necessarily about issues. Hmm. Gotcha. And I, so I, I have two quick questions, uh, and then Ben actually will transition us to policy while he has a resource question, uh, natural resource question. Uh, in terms of when you were talking to the PCPs, uh, what were like the primary issues that they were bringing up? Like, was there like, obviously it sounds like national resources was one of them, but was there other main issues of concern basically that they, you know, want you to focus on from representation perspective? Was it kind of all over the map? Uh, I'm always just really curious in terms of like what rural Dems are saying and kind of how we compare that to like what more Portland area, Valley area Democrats are saying, since more of those people generally come on our show, just because of course there is more Democrats in that area. But <laughs> yeah. uh, what were kind of the different issues that people were focusing on? People really care about housing. And I think that that's there's a really interesting comparison there. So when you talk about housing and homelessness in Portland, you know, homelessness is obviously a really big part of it, but you're also talking about the quality of housing and you're talking about rental standards and holding landlords accountable and tenant protections and density and all of these things. Um, it, that's a very different issue um, compared to how housing problems manifest on the coast. So in places like Cannon Beach and Seaside and Astoria and all the little towns in between, uh, you probably wouldn't be surprised to know that there are a lot of tourists in all of those towns. So of course, there are a lot of uh, short-term rentals, vacation homes, homes that people have purchased to use for Airbnb. And there's actually, in, in total, there's a surplus of housing, but not for the workforce. So when people talk about housing issues on the coast, they mean there's literally not enough housing to buy. What do you, when, that, you, when you say there's a surplus of housing, what do you mean by that? It means that 
if you look at all the housing that exists, there is actually, there's plenty, but because so much of it is used for second homes or for vacation or tourism purposes, um, there's just not, there is actually short of a, a shortage of housing as well for the workforce. And so you have just really crazy shortages that show up in different ways. Like I heard stories about, um, you know, a doctor who was hired, who had to live in a trailer, um, for months because he couldn't find a house, right. A doctor. Um, I heard about, uh, firefighters who volunteer firefighters who no longer qualified to serve as volunteer firefighters because they couldn't find housing within the 40 mile radius of their service district. And then I met this wonderful, uh, young guy. We, when we went um, to Seaside for the PCP convention, we met this waiter named Casper. The, the power went out when we were out uh, having dinner one night um, and we we're in this like theater restaurant. And so we kind of got on this um, and kind of started joking with them about like, did you arrange this exclusive haunted experience for us? <laughs> His um, name is Casper, <laughs> to be fair. I mean, <laughs> but he was delightful. He was so, he was so sweet. He was the nicest guy. And, you know, we just, we were there for long enough that I mentioned housing to him and asked him what his situation was like. And he told me that um, he actually is living in a three bedroom, two bath with seven adults and two kids. And he is sharing a room with another adult and paying $500 a month to do that. So that's the kind of, and everybody is aware, everybody knows that. So every call I got on with PCPs was about that. And every call I got on um, with county commissioners, they they definitely brought that up. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Uh, and then uh, two quick questions about the process, then we'll transition uh, over into policy. Uh, first off, when they were voting for between the three candidates, was it just whoever got the most votes won? Or was it like, okay, we did you know uh, this vote, then one person was eliminated, then it was between you and another person, then you obviously came out ahead. What was that sort of process like? Uh, and then my uh, added question to that was, from my understanding, this happened all over Zoom. Uh, it seemed like that would be such a strange experience to do this from your bedroom. Uh, and it looked like, at least from the pictures on the articles, that like people were in their bedrooms, they're in their house. How was how that? I mean, you literally like got appointed to elected office over a Zoom call. Uh, I just think that's the strangest thing. But uh, what was the experience like when the voting was actually happening? And then, of course, you, you came out ahead. Uh, well, it was so I'm kind of happy that it ha- happened on Zoom because I, uh, was able to take notes and and do things that um, and and compile my answers in ways that I wouldn't necessarily be able to do if I was at at a table. So that was helpful. I think the second reason it was really helpful that it happened over Zoom is that uh, as once I figured out that it was going to be me, I started crying a little bit. I started wanting to cry. Like my ears started welling up and my, my forehead kind of like started twitching, you know, like you do when you're right about to, to cry. And so I, I took a, I took a note from Hillary Clinton's book and I just started like pinching myself and like <laughs> doing all these things. <laughs> and you start crying cause it hurts so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I also had, um, I also had my, my darling sweet husband, um, re coaching me from the side and, and sharing very blunt feedback about my answers. We had a really easy system. It was either thumbs up, thumbs to the side or thumbs down. And he didn't have a problem after I'd answered a question from commissioners giving me that thumbs down. He's just, <laughs> you're, like, uh, you're like, well, going into the next question with a lot of confidence, Re. thanks for the down vote. <laughs> that's great. That's a great point, Dan. Thank you for bringing that up. <laughs> um, so it, it was very different. The PCPs were in person. Um, and I, the, the other part of that process that I, I want to bring up about, about that part of it is that we also had Nadia. So, you know, me and I, I really introduced myself in relation to Melissa or really, frankly, I introduced myself as the number two to anybody the, the PCPs wanted to support because not everybody was a supporter of Melissa in the beginning. And so mm-hmm. I really was able to, to talk to everybody and, and really talk about my own merits and say, listen, you know, um, 
uh, no matter who you're voting for, I, I would hope that you'd consider me your number two. And then um, Nadia is, is just this super sharp uh, person over in Arch Cape. She sits on planning commission. She's, she's got quite a policy brain. Um, she is one of the most intelligent people I think I've, I've ever met. And um, so as that third woman, I think once she stepped on the scene and she had a lot of relationships on the other side of the district, it was pretty easy for PCPs to sort of envision this three women's slate where we have Melissa and then we have two other women um, who would support her. Like that's, that was pretty, so that was pretty cool to see that happen. And, and what a, what an answer to Senator Bensie Johnson um, stepping down to say, like, we're going to give you, you know, three women in this district to, to follow. Like, that made me pretty proud. Um, it, yeah, it, it was a very, it was a very cool process. Was that your second question, Titus? I think that was the first yes. part of the question. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, so I want to, I was looking really quick. Uh, oh, yeah, so. This is, I, I'm glad you brought that up. So the PCPs nominated three women to replace a woman. Um, yeah. There's been a lot of talk about how the legislature, like the house I believe is majority women. Um, so there's been a lot of talk about, oh, look how far we've come. So before your appointment, uh, only seven out of 30 senators in the Oregon State Senate were women. So women were still actually vastly underrepresented in the state Senate side. Um, Janine Solman uh, will, up the ratio a bit you I think will keep it or maybe I don't know oh yeah yeah I think you will be number eight and nine um which is still an underrepresentation. but just an interesting note as we talk about and think about representation equity diversity etc um okay so transitioning into the policy section I'm going to read a, an excerpt from your website and then I want to have a conversation about it so okay. you write and I think you're, you're yeah you're referencing Medford here Rachel also grew up witnessing the decline of the timber industry in Southern Oregon. Although the community always came together, it sometimes wasn't enough. Over the years, Rachel watched as families lost their livelihoods and as funding dried up for important services like education roads and public safety. Um, we've talked a little bit on the show. I can't remember who the guest was, Alex, but we've talked about timber policy a, a few times. And I think it was actually Alex Scarlatos. Um, yeah, I think it was Alex. So what I said to him was basically, my belief is that because of a combination of factors, but especially automation and regulation, um, both of which, in my opinion, are irreversible. We're not going backwards. Uh, we're not going to get rid of the Endangered Species Act, and we're not going to like you know make it less efficient to harvest timber. Um, there's really no path of us going backwards to the economy of the 1980s. Like we're not going to be able to sustain the livelihoods of what used to be timber dependent economies just by shifting timber policy. Like we actually need something else. Um, so I guess, A, I'm curious what your take is on that. And B, if you have like a theory of what we can do to bring life back to these formerly timber dependent communities that truly have been left behind and ravaged by uh, really significant shifts in the economy. Um, you grew up in one of those areas, but the area that you're representing now in the Senate is very much one of those areas where when timber left, like uh, poverty just expanded massively. Um, so I guess I'm curious what, what you think about moving forward, what do we do? You know, to be honest, I have learned a lot about this issue over the last couple of weeks. Um, I have always, I like to say, I've always been familiar with timber culture, but timber policy is something I, I only had um, a working knowledge on. It's not, it's, it's still not something I'm an expert in. Uh, and what I would say about this, this part of Oregon is that uh, forestry isn't going away. Logging's not going away. And I, I am at this point sympathetic to the idea that it probably in some capacity shouldn't go away. I, one thing I hadn't thought about is that, you know, in a sustainable future, um, a lot of our buildings and a lot of our construction is made of wood. I mean, that's an incredibly um, environmentally friendly material in a lot of ways. Um, and, and so that industry 
on some level should always exist. And we have a lot of other things to think about too. We have, um, we have species to protect, um, particularly fish, which also contribute to uh, our uh, economy in a big way, particularly in Clatsop County. Um, we also have uh, water, you know, I think there are a lot of folks who are rightfully concerned about maintaining and preserving clean drinking water. And um, naturally with timber, um, timber work and forestry and logging practices, there does tend to be sediment that gets into the water sources. I also um, have heard different people talk about pesticides. And so all, all of these different things, they work together. And so when, when, we're working on this policy, I think we really do have to consider all of these different things, not to mention the fact that these counties are, the majority of their income comes from timber revenue. So it, here it is really a staple as much as it won't always be um, the main source of jobs with mechanization and automation and things like that. Um, the revenue itself will always contribute to this district. And I think that there is an argument for um, sustainable logging practices. I hope that with the upcoming um, timber accord, I, is it the timber accord or the forest accord? One of the two, uh, this upcoming accord, um, that that is gonna be something where timber companies and environmentalists get together and can pave a path forward for how they work together, which is really important because this ongoing litigation that keeps happening is, is good for no one and certainly not for the economy. So the other part of that question is really where we go from here and not to just get super, you know, wonky, but I'll, I think a lot of people from Portland and other places will really write these communities off and say, just just turn everything into a tourism economy. Well, we can't because we have a housing shortage. Like, and that's also true of, of Columbia County. Like you can't you can't just say, just become a tourist economy and it'll be fine. Because really we're not empowering this district to have the infrastructure that it takes to successfully uh, be a tourist economy and, and particularly not with timber yeah. or with housing rather. Um, particularly not um, with housing. So I, I think there are a number of answers to that question. I also think that broadband is a really big part of that. I think in order to participate in a global economy from wherever we are, we do have to have better access to the internet in these communities um, and, and a better education systems and things like that. But, you know, it's, it's really about a balance. And you said now we're going to policy. So <laughs> <laughs> no, that that was a very comprehensive answer. Um, I have a, a few things. I ju just was listening to a podcast where somebody described um, community colleges as the 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 base the bridge basically between the old economy and the new new economy. Like it's not actually four year institutions that are preparing. Um, folks for the workforce as immediately as community colleges. So I actually think that might be part of it. And you, I think you have a couple of community colleges in your district. Um, but I always wonder like, and I don't know, there's not a good or right answer to this, but like, to your point, like if you, if you were working in the woods, if you were working in timber industry, like you actually don't want to go be a hotel clerk, probably. You probably don't actually want to be a maid who's changing beds. You probably you probably don't actually want to be a restaurant worker either. Um, and so that like, so I guess I, I just don't, it's hard to imagine what does the next economy. And it's also hard to imagine those folks wanting to go learn how to code, for example. Like that's the, the right, actually there's some, the right was dismissing the left for saying like the answer was to like teach these teach these workers from the 1980s and 1990s economy how to code like that's not a realistic solution so I guess in Alex I'm open to your thoughts here too but any thoughts on or imagination about what the next industry uh, or industries might look like for these parts of Oregon yeah it's I mean it's it's particularly difficult too because uh and and not not to get too nerdy from the tech side because of course I 
own a tech consulting business. Actually, I think a lot of the, the coding jobs might go away over the next 10 years because uh, computers are getting better, getting better at writing code. And like, basically, people are going to be doing things what's called like point and click configuration, which is I do something on the back end, basically, the computer writes the code for me. Uh, that was super nerdy. But no, that's uh, actually, like, that's fascinating. So basically, the thing that people were saying, oh, this is what you should go get retraining to do also might actually be going away, which would be like double devastating. Yeah, exactly. So I, I think it's 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 really hard to predict. And uh, I mean, and I don't know exactly what the salaries look like, but like, I also imagine just being like working in Timber, you probably get paid more substantially than like being a restaurant worker, or, like being a hotel clerk or something like that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I think that the trend, I mean, I mean, that's the issue. Like, no, like nobody has the perfect answer for this, right? Because I... Uh, even if we were to say like remove all of the regulations on timber, right? Like some of those jobs still just won't come back because of globalization and things like that. So uh, yeah, I mean, that's like the unfortunate thing is I just don't really think either party has a good answer to this right now. And uh, maybe that wasn't even a helpful answer, but that's kind of, that's kind of where I, we, we clearly need to brainstorm better on that <laughs> one. <laughs> you so, know, yeah, and I, I can't speak for, you know, I, th I think there are places in the state that are really, truly down and out in that way. I think, um, you know, again, Grants Pass, Roseburg, these these places that are just hot spots for 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 timber um, really are struggling to figure out what those next steps are. I don't know that the coast is. I, I actually think that there are plenty of jobs and there will be plenty of jobs um in in the future i i am i sort of see there being a lot in emergency preparedness mm. um climate disaster mitigation things like that um you know a, a lot of opportunities where people will still be able to work with their hands which i know people find a lot of pride in um and again i even though it, it will still it'll it'll continue to be more automated in the future. I do think that those logging jobs will forever exist or, or will exist into, into the future. Um, I think we need to work with our communities and what they need right now. It's so, you know, we can talk about the future all we want to, but we're really not meeting current needs. And the reality is that people have jobs and they can't take them because they don't have a place to live. So, you know, I, I think there's more that we can do to meet needs right now. I, th I think people to the same, to the same point, I think that, you know, a lot of people on both sides of the district have plenty of ideas of things that they could do online or businesses that they can open and they don't have the internet access to do it. Um, so it's really more about meeting an immediate need. Um, and I think if we can set that infrastructure up, I think there's plenty of room in this district uh, to grow. Great answer. Yeah, that, that's interesting. And uh, one thing we wanted to ask you a little bit about is kind of like political realignment in general. Uh, and I'll just keep that very baseline in terms of saying that the uh, suburbs are moving much more towards the Democratic Party and rural areas are moving much more towards the Republican Party uh, than, than they were before. Uh, you obviously represent a district, which is, of course, uh, held by Senator Johnson, who I think most people on the right and probably the left would consider to be much more moderate uh, than your your Democrat on average. Someone got, uh, someone got mad at me because I described her as a moderate and they said she's not a moderate. She's a conservative, which I found very telling. <laughs> fair, she might literally be one of the last like Democratic conservatives left, uh, which, of course, used to be a much bigger coalition, the Democratic Party before various changes and things like that. Uh, but like, I, I think that that one, it makes it, it probably makes it frankly harder for you to talk about the issues that you want to talk about, because if you're talking about like retaining timber jobs and things like that, like maybe that causes a primary challenge or something like that. And someone tries to pull you further to the left, uh, similar if a Republican was running in a, a suburban district. But uh, I'm just sort of curious of your general thoughts. Like, do you think that Democrats can still win in districts like like the one that you're in now? And I know especially it's getting a little bit more conservative even after redistricting. Uh, and if so, like what what do you kind of think that that winning agenda looks like for a Democrat to be able to hold a seat like that? I think it's super nuanced, and I am not I'm not gonna you know kind of 
rail on Portland Democrats or Willamette Valley Democrats too much. But I think there's not there's not really a corruption thing here. I think a lot of people point to Democrats and say, oh, corruption, oh, bad mismanagement. And, you know, um, there's definitely room for improvement, but I don't necessarily know that it's a, it's a question of corruption. I think there are people who are elected to represent their districts and their districts look very different than this district. And so there's just sort of this natural um, oblivion I think that happens with Democrats when there aren't a lot of them who represent rural districts in those caucus meetings and in those priority agenda setting meetings and and they fall short all the time. Um, and that's not necessarily um, I don't I don't think that that's necessarily something that they do um, out of bad intention. I, I just think it's we all have different perspectives and that's fine. Um, but I do think that people feel that sense of being left out. And so my goal is really more than being accountable to PCPs and party Democrats, who, by the way, I still have a lot of respect for, and I think they're, they're super smart and wonderful. My, my accountability is really to folks who feel marginalized in that way. They let, they feel left out, um, of, what's happening in Salem. And so I, I think we can do a lot by bringing p folks into the process and making them feel heard a lot more. And, and Senator Johnson, I think was really good at that. Mm. So um, we got a couple more questions and we're gonna be close to time. So um, I wanna ask a somewhat logistical question here. So you get appointed to the, you get appointed to become a state Senator and then the short legislative session, which will be your only session, unless there's a special session. Mm -hmm. Uh, it starts in like a week and a half. <laughs> um, yep, yep. So you basically have, so it, that session, which will be about a month, you'll basically have one month to do what you, whatever you're able to do for your district, aside from the town halls and constituent services, like really on a policy level, you've got a month to do whatever you're going to be able to do. Um, and so in this next two weeks, you have to figure out what's going on in Salem you have to build some relationships with legislators. You have to hire a staff person or two. You have to try to get on the committees you want to get on. You need to meet all the lobbyists. And oh, by the yeah. way, you have a full-time job that is not being a state senator that is somehow going to have to figure into this. So can you actually, for, for listeners who are like, how do these people do this? How are you logistically moving through the next week and a half trying to get ready for this like incredibly important 30-day stretch? Yeah, so we're not sleeping anymore. Um, <laughs> Sleeping's canceled. Sleeping is canceled. <laughs> um, meal times, 15 minutes tops. Um, you know, I think I've gotten into a pretty good flow of having conversations with a lot of people in the evenings. And I, um, my uh, Facebook messages, email inbox, text messages, voicemails are currently inundated with people I need to talk to. And I'm really excited to have those conversations. Um, it, it seems like a lot of those will be able to happen at, during lunchtime or after the workday. I think there's a pretty good understanding that most folks uh, who um, serve in the legislature do also have day jobs, which is great. There's uh, definitely... I, there's definitely someone listening to this who's like, I called Rachel. She hasn't called me back yet. And now she's doing a podcast. Are you kidding me? Just kidding. If I haven't called you back yet, I, <laughs> I am like today. It's going to happen. Um, and I, I've, I've tried to keep up as best I can. Um, and it, it really has been fun to talk to so many people who have different interests in the district. And I'm, I'm, I think there are a lot of people out there who have a lot to teach me. So it's exciting in that way as well. As far as staff is concerned, um, I have already extended an offer to a chief of staff, um, somebody I'm really excited to bring on with me. Um, and then uh, we will be conducting interviews in the next couple of days and figuring out what the, who the second staff will be. Um, and we're hoping to hire somebody from the district and bring that kind of insight and knowledge on board. So I'm really excited about that as well. Um, otherwise, I, I don't know. I do not know how we're going to get it all done. I am really excited to find out. And I think that's a really nerdy thing to say, but it fits. <laughs> I, I guess here we go. <laughs> all right, Alex. Uh, 
the 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 ship has left the station. So uh, <laughs> the, the best of luck. You know, it's it's like one of those uh, rocket launches. You know, you hope everything goes well, and maybe there's an explosion in the air. But it, <laughs> fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, I should I should say again. You know, laundry day is today. Taking <laughs> Christmas decorations down happens today. Otherwise, it is not happening until <laughs> April March. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no, very good. Uh, and then, yeah, just the, the last question I wanted to ask you uh, is kind of about generational divide. So there is, uh, I guess I wouldn't say a lot, but there is a number of younger people who are now uh, moving into the state legislature. So there's you, uh, there's Representative Campos, who we've had on the show, there's Rep Ruiz, uh, Ben will likely be elected to the legislature uh, coming in this upcoming year. Uh, I'm just sort of curious in terms of like, how do you think that generation, and maybe there's just not enough uh, young people, air quotes, uh, elected yet to the legislature, you know, and there's all these like think pieces and all this stuff like, oh, the millennials are coming and it's finally <laughs> happening and the issues are going to be new. And like, I, I think a lot of that's over exaggerated because a lot of politicians are still much older than millennials, obviously, but uh, there is sort of like fresh blood coming into the legislature, uh, mostly on the Democratic side, but probably on the Republican side coming up too. Uh, how do you think that that changes, if it does at all, kind of like the issues that are prioritized and that people mm. are talking about? Um, well, first of all, I, I just want to say I look forward to um, having more young Republicans join us. Um, I had a lot of great friendships with young Republicans while I was at U, U of O. Um, some of my some of my best times were hanging out with <laughs> hanging out with you, to be honest, I, I really enjoyed it. Um, but I, you know, I think, um, it's, it's weird to think that I am going to be the youngest person in the Oregon state Senate. Uh, I, I (laughs) thought I had missed that boat, frankly, in my thirties, I don't necessarily know that I feel like that should be the case. Uh, Um, Actually, quick question. Maybe you don't know the answer. Would you be, are you the youngest person ever? Or is there someone else yeah. who's been younger? Okay. No. There have been, there've been like 20 somethings. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But, but for now I will, I will definitely be the youngest person. Um, so, you know, I think that with younger folks comes a certain level of efficiency that, that happens. I, I don't know how to describe it. I just think that you know, growing up on social media and figuring out how to do things quicker and more effectively and the point of view that we have, I think, lends itself um, to urgency and efficiency. I also think that we're not all coming to the legislature through law degrees. And so we have more varied professional expertise that we're bringing in. Um, And so I think, you know, a lot of problems that I've heard about with state agency is a sort of this lack of programmatic continuity, which as, as an attorney, I don't, I don't, there are a lot of amazing skill sets that you bring to the legislature as an attorney. And I don't necessarily know that that's one of them, but that's certainly something that um, I can bring as somebody who's worked at a nonprofit. And so I, I just think that there's a certain sharpness to millennials that um, in the legislature will be really fun to see. And, and I think the other part of that is that for me, the answer is TBD. You might have to ask me after the legislature, after I've had the opportunity to work with Rep. Campos and Rep. Ruiz um, and and Rep. or Senator Lawrence Spence. I'm really excited to meet her. I cannot wait. Um, so definitely ask me again after session that, that question. Well, we'll have to do a, a millennial podcast. Um, that would be them, so fun. That would be super fun. <laughs> Uh, so I pulled up the list. I actually don't have any senators on this list to reference, but so here are some of the names of young legislators. So there was, there have been three state legislators who were elected at 23. Um, so quick, this is like a very random question, um, but one of the county commissioners who voted for you was named Margaret Magruder, right? Do you know if she has a husband or brother named Dick Magruder? Uh I don't know who that would be in relation to her, but I know she comes from a family of politicians. So Dick Magruder was first elected in 1970 to the state legislature as a 23-year-old student. Wow. Um, Rep. Earl Blumenauer, 24, when first elected. 
uh, Rep. Ryan Deckard, who folks probably know, um, elected at 25, and Mark Hatfield uh, elected at 28 in 1950. And the quote says, at the time, he was the youngest legislator in Oregon and still lived at his parents' home. So you are a full-fledged adult compared to uh, Mark Hatfield in 1950. I love knowing that. <laughs> I feel better for knowing that. Uh, so Rachel, thank you again for, for coming on. Our, our, we're going to call it an exclusive interview, your first long-form interview um, post-appointment. Our final wrap-up question is, you know, folks want to be following what you're doing in the state legislature, or they want to be in touch with you. What's the best way for them to get connected? Oh, gosh, um, definitely find me on Facebook. Um, my Facebook page is Rachel for SD 16. And then my email is Rachel for Oregon at gmail.com. Please email me. I would love to I'd love to connect. Um, and I definitely look forward to meeting a, a bunch of different constituents and stakeholders. Awesome. All right. Well, thanks again to yes. Senator Designate or Designate. Thanks for having me. Don't know <laughs> Rachel Armitage. And for our listeners, uh, don't forget to subscribe on whatever platform you're listening to this on. If you're allowed to, give us a five star rating and subscribe to our newsletter, uh, theoregonway.substack.com, at least for now. Uh, thanks everybody, and we'll see you next week. Love it. Thank you.